Hello, everyone, and welcome to Maryland Center for History and Culture's virtual program for the evening. I want to thank you for tuning in. We have a great program lined up this evening, Black Activism in Maryland, and uh, I am I am very happy to be joined by some very special guests here to talk about our exhibition, Passion and Purpose, Voices of Maryland's Civil Rights Activists. Um, this is a long-term or permanent exhibition that relies chiefly on oral histories and photography to tell the story of the civil rights movement in Maryland. It is intended to serve as a tool for educators, students, and the community to learn about the rich history of the civil rights movement in our state. I would like to briefly introduce our panelists for the evening, and I say briefly because I'm going to allow them a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, but first up, we have Linda Day Clark, a visual artist and professor in the Department of Humanities at Coppin State University. We have Joshua Clark Davis, Associate Professor of U.S. History at the University of Baltimore. And we have David Taft Terry, Associate Professor of History and Coordinator of Museum Studies at Morgan State University. Uh, welcome, panelists. I cannot hear you. Yep, we're here. There Thank we you. go. <laughs> so, um, hi. Um, I'd like to start by uh, asking you to uh, uh, introduce yourself, um, maybe talk about your field of study or your specific interests um, before we get into talking about um, your work in helping us create this exhibition. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Day Clark, and I'm an artist, an educator, and a curator. I wear many hats. I do a, a large amount of community work in Maryland. I've taught at Coppin State for a quarter of a century, and uh, I curate with many local institutions and I try to give back uh, by way of planting seeds with my students. Josh, would you like to go next? Sure, hi, uh, I'm Joshua Davis, a history professor at the University of Baltimore. And um, I'm really lucky that I was asked to be a part of this exhibit, happy to be a part of this event tonight. Um, I'm very interested in Baltimore's history, of course. Um, I helped co-edit a book several years ago called Baltimore Revisited, an essay collection with uh, Nicole King and Kate Drabinsky of UMBC, about 27 essays on Baltimore's history. Um, and uh, I also am currently working on a book about the history of police in the civil rights movement from a, a national perspective. And that's both the forgotten history of the civil rights movement's activism against police abuses and police brutality. And from the other end, in many ways, the erased history of local police repression of the civil rights movement. Um, but I'm interested in the movement very, very broadly, and not just in that particular topic, and happy to be here tonight. Thanks, Josh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Terry. As I stated, I'm an associate professor of history at Morgan. Um, you know, I have been interested in and working on and around uh, civil rights history, Maryland history, Baltimore history uh, for the better part of 25 years myself. I, I laughed when Linda, I talked about how teaching, how long she had been teaching, and I realized, you know, I've been right there with her. So um, I have uh, worked. Uh, in some of the uh, uh, key institutions that deal with history and particularly African-American history here in the state or uh, education, I've been very fortunate. Uh, in my, my relationship with Morgan goes back many years. Uh, I, I did uh, work for the Maryland State Archives, uh, much of which uh, I think is uh, still in use in terms of uh, projects like the one we're gonna be talking about tonight. I'm very proud of that work. And, and certainly uh, working with the Reginald F. Lewis Museum downtown. Uh, I, I have seen uh, over the course of my career thus far, how fortunate we are in this state to have so many institutions uh, bringing 
uh, a new focus and, and uh, a fresh nuance to the history that we, we, uh, we are attempting uh, to pull together and reclaim and put to best uses. And I'm certainly blessed to be on a panel uh, with Linda and Josh, uh, who are doing just wonderful work in their field. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you, David. And uh, once again, thank you all for agreeing to do this. Um, I am going to pose some questions and uh, I'll just make them general and whoever's feeling it can jump in. And um, I'm sure we won't talk over each other. It'll, um, it'll be great. So um, the first question uh, I wanted to ask is, how do you think passion and purpose's interpretation of the civil rights movement in Maryland um, add something new for our current times? Uh, I think it adds something new uh, because I think it was so interactive in a sense and fluid in its creation uh, with this panel that uh, we three are a part of and there's many more people on that panel who contributed uh, to the process. And as we were doing it, we were able to say, oh, well, you know, we need to include current events, the Ravens taking a knee or the uh, Freddie Gray uprising or Black Lives Matter. And so it, I don't think it's an exhibition that talks about events in the past, but it's in a, about activism that continues. So we pay homage and legacy, but it's, I think it's to inspire continued activism. And, and that's one of the things I love about it. Josh, you want to take it or? Sure. Um, you know, I, this is a really important exhibit. One thing, you know, that David said that I think was really smart when we were advising on it early on was, um, we need to make sure with this exhibit that we're not replicating what other exhibits have done because there are other institutions that have done incredibly important work and are continuing to do. So uh, the Lewis Museum, right? Uh, the Lily Carroll Jackson House. And I think what this exhibit adds to the conversation is that it really looks at the, the civil rights movement, both as a long movement and as a broad movement in, in Baltimore and Maryland. And, you know, just to kind of briefly summarize, the historiography has made tremendous strides in the last 20 years in terms of how historians understand the civil rights movement. Uh, number one is the idea of a long civil rights movement, the idea that the movement goes back at least to the 30s and at least as far forward as the 70s, if not the 80s. Um, you know, look at David's book, Struggle in the Urban South, uh, for a really key example of that kind of thinking where, they're, you know, he was looking at the civil rights movement much earlier than most people were doing even 30 years ago, 25 years ago. But then also, this is a broad movement, and I think the exhibit really captures that in terms of not just thinking about uh, desegregating lunch counters and public transportation, but looking at the real breadth of causes of the movement, some of which we don't always remember, um, from housing to, um, you know, police brutality comes up, um, to, you know, just also ideologically broad, things like the Black Panthers, who didn't necessarily call themselves the civil rights movement, but were part of a larger movement for racial equality and for racial justice and for black empowerment. So I think that's two of the big things this exhibit's really doing in a way that's kind of incorporating some of these insights of the historiography of the last few decades and bringing it to a broader audience. I would, I would agree uh, wholeheartedly uh, with uh, what Josh uh, just offered. And I, I thought about the exhibition in that way uh, when I suggested uh, that we sort of look where other exhibitions perhaps have not looked, you know, in, uh, in, in the academic world, uh, you know, we are really beginning to pick some locks to uh, uh, reveal some fresh perspectives on the civil rights movement. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, not too long ago uh, that to do a civil rights narrative was essentially to talk about how and when and where MLK 
affected your local situation or your grasp of MLK's impact on the, the national situation. But in recent years, uh, the past 15, 20 years, certainly as, as Josh pointed out, you know, we've been looking at other ways to understand the struggle for equality uh, and the civil rights movement and the black power phase of that movement and the iterations that have uh, sort of shaped our country and been demanded by our citizens uh, since the 1970s. So there's really been this wonderful dynamic energy that has looked to understand not simply the history of the struggle, but its legacy, its meaning, its usefulness uh, to us now. So uh, the way in which I think passion and purpose uh, uh, can touch on that is that it fits into that mold. Uh, Baltimore's civil rights story, you know, as we sit in 2022, for those who have been paying attention, even as students, you know, there are enough curricula out there, there have been enough uh, articles written, enough uh, historical plaques, there's certainly enough museum ex uh, exhibits that have approached it from one uh, point of view or another. We can get a sense of the basic arcs and the basic characters of Baltimore civil rights history. Uh, uh, that being said, passion and purpose uh, does not deny the role, for example, of the Baltimore NAACP or of the Black church of the, of the Afro-American. But what it does is use those uh, institutions, those uh, entities as the pillars for showing how everyday Baltimoreans sort of found their way in struggle or found their way toward the front lines, perhaps for moments of their life. And as well as those activists who very purposely put themselves out front and committed to long-term struggle and long-term mm -hmm. acts of resistance. So I just think the, the nuance of this exhibition, its reliance on oral history uh, allowing voices quite literally to speak to us, you know, for themselves. It's, it's, I think it's a wonderful statement on what we know, what we have recovered and what we still are sort of seeking in terms of our understanding of that movement and how we can use its history today. Uh, Joe, if I could just piggyback on that. Uh, I agree with uh, everything that's been said. And I think that is the thing when you ask the question, what do we think of uh, the interpretation of this exhibition. And what I love is that it has, in my mind, limited interpretation. The power of it is that it's people telling their own stories. We're hearing their voices uh, telling their stories. And if you're in the space, in the gallery space, there's a lovely, you know, in my mind, I hear it, a kind of call and response. I mean, you're listening to people tell their, their own experiences and not being reinterpreted, right? Just validating uh, their personal roles and, and, and their stories about this bigger movement. Um, and so I think that is, that is just so powerful. So you hear that message and then it generates within the gallery, lots of conversation, you know, people responding. So when I've been in the gallery, there's a lovely, you know, cacophony of noise in a sense, right, of the sounds of people telling the story and people responding to the story and people remembering their own experiences and adding that to the mix. So I, I think it's a, a lovely exhibition to um, experience uh, and to hear it from, as David said, everyday people. That's important to me, the everyday, I think there's a real community feel uh, to the exhibition. Uh, thank you all for that wonderful context. Uh, I, I was just in the gallery today. I sort of wanted to walk through again to sort of refresh myself for this evening. And it was filled with students. Mm. And I, I sort of was like, oh, I don't want to get in their way or interrupt them. So I just sort of, uh, laid back and, and watched, and it was pretty great. Um, Linda, you also brought up a great point that uh, we put together an advisory curatorial panel to make this exhibition happen. And you are three of, uh, I, I don't know the total number. It, it, it seems like there was maybe a dozen of us or more. I think um, so. I, I, I should uh, have everyone's name to read off, but if I try to do it from memory, I'll leave someone out and feel bad. But, um, but you were three of our uh, 
of our advisory curatorial panel. And um, it was it was an amazing experience to work with all of you. Um, I want to sort of break it down uh, uh, with that context that you just gave. Um, the exhibition, I, I think I approached some of you maybe in February of 20, uh, 2020 about doing this. So this was almost you know two years in the making. We opened this exhibition in May of this year. Um, so we had a long time to work on it. And I want to talk a little bit about how it changed in the time that we worked. Um, the title change, there was a title change that was uh, uh, advocated. I, I want to say maybe it was Linda, but it, it was from the curatorial panel. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition, I, I'm not sure that we started off knowing that this was going to be uh, relying on mostly oral histories to tell this story at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, could, could each of you sort of weigh in with what you remember about, um, about you know, how the exhibition changed, changes you may have advocated for? Mm -hmm. uh, I, you're right. There's a larger group of us and we all did our best to contribute equally and like, uh, you know, John Lewis, we tried to make good trouble, right? So we got in the way of a few things. And, uh, but it was a wonderful collaboration, right, with the museum and their desire to better represent uh, or contribute to the greater conversation of the civil rights. And I, we, I think we all loved that they reached out to so many people in the community from diverse backgrounds to try to contribute. I doubt that they realized mm -hmm. what they were in for, <laughs> you know, when so many voices came at them, you know, but the, the, everybody did their part and it was beautiful. So I'm a visual artist, uh, I'm a photographer, and so, yes, it was a revelation in that process when I realized, oh, we're talking about oral histories because I kept trying to figure out, well, what is it going to look like and what is the flow going to be and, you know, visual things. And then I realized we were working toward and it had evolved in my mind, at least to, toward oral histories, which was beautiful, a beautiful, you know, way to organically kind of get to that place. Um, and so I think we all contributed in different ways. These two gentlemen, I believe, have done endless research specifically on these topics. Um, and uh, for me, it was largely about engagement, you know, how are visitors going to come in and interact with what we show? How can we make a subject that people have talked about uh, again and again, fascinating? And uh, so, yes, there was a number of name changes. Actually, everything changed. Uh, it was just as your institution was changing its name, yes. And we changed the name of the exhibition. And that's kind of what I meant by making good trouble. We'd had a good work session, I believe, that particular day. And we were wrapping up. We had, uh, you know, identified a couple of challenges and worked them out. And, and then as we're closing, I think I was just like, I have to say the title is, you know, bothering me. And boom, you know, so but we had discussion about that. And it went back and forth. And I think we came to... Uh, an understanding, you know, a perspective. And that's kind of what the, uh, the panel is for. Um, and so it was, it was really some beautiful community work, you know, working with uh, the Maryland Center for History and Culture and all these diverse voices coming and give and take and insight to all these different expertise uh, it was, you know, I wish we'd filmed that. That would have been. Just uh, as a point of clarification, um, you all were approached by the Maryland Historical Society mm -hmm. to uh, do 
to yeah. work on this, and then we changed mm -hmm. our name. And and for the record, uh, I think most of you were approached when the name of this exhibition was going to be "I Shall Overcome Someday." Right. And I think that was prior to the realization that oral histories were going to be yeah. a, a thing. So I'll shut up now and let um, Josh or David talk. Uh, can I, I'm sorry, I'm loud. Uh, can I just say one other name change? I think it might have come from the realization that you had these loud voices like mine who's always jumping in. Uh, even our name change. I think we were an advisory panel first and then we became a curatorial panel because I think it was such an interaction. It wasn't just, hey, we're doing this. What do you think? And we all said, hey, it's great. And, you know, we went home. It was uh, some true uh, synergy. Yeah, so I'll, um, I'll say this about uh, uh, the, the topic. Um, it may, I don't know if it was the first conversation, but the early conversation about what this project wanted to do. I think it was uh, you and I, Joe. And um, the idea that uh, that institution, the, at the time, the Maryland Historical Society, now the Maryland Center for History and Culture, uh, might miss the opportunity to show off just the, I mean, most of the pictures that you see of early Baltimore, certainly, and many of, of uh, all the different aspects of the Baltimore community over the years, most of the pictures you see on the internet or, or you see in even other institutions, exhibitions, you know, they come from the collections in this, in this institution. And having worked with the oral history collections for easily on and off two decades, um, and I'll have more to say about that uh, later on in the program, I'm like, dude, you have the oral history collection to be desired about this topic. You have photo correct collections, particularly when you think of the Paul Henderson uh, uh, items uh, that have come in in recent years. You have the voices, you have the people. You know, this is, this is the, the story's going to tell itself. You simply have to get out of the way and, and let people sort of engage it because, you know, uh, as, as a scholar who works uh, in, in uh, cultural uh, institutions and museums and archives, et cetera, you know, I, I love the exhibitions, but for me, it's always about the resources, the source material. So, I mean, if you love this exhibition, man, wait till you see the library, wait till you see the stuff that's in the manuscript collection, wait till you hear the oral history, you see the list. I mean, I was a student the first time I read about Thurgood Marshall in college and how his fight really began here in Maryland in terms of uh, challenging the legal structures of Jim Crow. And, you know, there was this guy who went to law school in the 30s uh, and actually got into the University of Maryland because of Thurgood Marshall and others. And his name was Donald Murray. And I'd heard about him for years. Now, wait a minute. You have his voice on record. I can hear him tell me about his. Man, come on. It was, it's just obvious that this was the way we had to go. Yeah, I mean, um, continuing along that line, I think two things that were important changes to my mind. Um, so the MCHC has these incredible collections um, that David and Linda were referring to. You know, just one example of the McKeldin Jackson Oral History Collection, um, which, you know, I think was most of those interviews were conducted in the 70s. And a nice thing about that collection is that as a part of this exhibit, they were digitized and most of them had not been before. I think one change we kind of um, orchestrated through the advisory committee was realizing that there's even more oral histories and, you know, kind of things here and there in all these different collections. There's no single collection. Uh, University of Baltimore has some stuff. Morgan has some stuff. The Library of Congress did a really big project on oral histories about the civil rights movement. And several of those are about um, Baltimore, uh, University of North Carolina. And it was kind of like realizing that, um, you know, the core of the story is in this McKeldin Jackson collection, but that there are important pieces in other collections that we wanted to pull in. So that was a, a, a really nice change for us, I think, to work on. And another thing, and it's a bit of a hobby horse for me, it's a little specific, but, you know, when we think about 
four major organizations in the civil rights movement of the 60s. Um, we're usually talking about NAACP. Most people know the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King and company. Um, most people know about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, right? Uh, John Lewis, uh, Diane Nash, many other people, famous, famous people. Um, you know, probably the least known of those four today is the Congress of Racial Equality mm -hmm. Core. And Core is, if anything, the general public maybe remembers them because of how famous the Freedom Rides are. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, it was really important to make sure that we had quite a bit on Core in this exhibit because Core was so important in Baltimore civil rights movement. And it it, it typically played second fiddle. To the to the NAACP and to you know the Jacksons and the Mitchells and those big names that we know and have on the fronts of buildings today, rightly so. But its legacy in the city has been kind of forgotten. Um, you know, to give one kind of brief example, if you know Senator Jill Carter, her father was Walter Carter, and he was the chairperson of the local core chapter in Baltimore. He died at a pretty early age in 1971. They had a really big funeral for him when he died, and, and people and newspapers referred to him as Mr. Civil Rights. Um, we have an elementary school in Baltimore named after him, but otherwise, he's not that well remembered. And I think um, the larger message here is that there's a really big story about the movement in this city and state, and it took a lot of work to pull it in. There's no single book on the history of the movement in Baltimore. There's no single archival collection. And this exhibit really tried to tell a wide lens story in a way that was really ambitious. And I think it pulled off. Yeah. I think so. Um, I was just going to say, I, I agree with what Josh and David are saying. And that was really one of the interesting things for me working on the committee was uh, it was a learning point for me, too. I've always known that Maryland's history is rich. Uh, but we would start a conversation and David would say, well, have you reached out to whoever? And then Josh would say, well, how about so-and-so? And this, you know, and it was, I was like, well, I don't know about them. You know, let me write this down myself, you know? So it was wonderful how they kept uh, suggesting community groups and, and reference points. And I remember one of the messages from the museum when they came back, they said, I know it's been a little while since our last meeting, but we want you to know we've been working. We reached out to over a hundred cultural groups, you know, cultural institutions in Maryland and they listed these things. And so I think, you know, I think we have to remember it, it really is the passion of the museum to want to do this right. And, you know, we kind of just tweaked away and helped to give it perhaps a broader perspective. These two especially were constantly referencing it's, you know, their, their field to, to study and, and research. And it, it, I think they just had a, a wonderful impact on how the outcome of the exhibition, how it feels and how it looks. I would be uh, remiss if I did not mention that um, David uh, talked about our oral history collections at MCHC, but David also had conducted many of his own interviews and shared them with us. And, and we were able to use them in the exhibition. And that was just a huge help to us. And Josh, you really did uh, advocate for including Walter Carter, which led us to find a great film that we were able to use audio from. Um, so it, it really was such an impressive uh, group effort. Um, I, my next question, I, I feel like I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about um, the challenges of a predominantly white institution like the Maryland Center for History and Culture, formerly the Maryland Historical Society, um, a, a PWI tackling the story of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was early on, um, we were cautioned about using the oppression lens or POV. And um, I, I'm wondering if uh, any of you can speak a little about that. Well, um, I was probably the voice uh, on the panel as, as much as any other 
uh, not necessarily dismissing those concerns, but uh, as the uh, Maryland Historical Society was reinventing itself as the Maryland Center for History and Culture, and that we're putting so many resources, uh, I say we have on the board of uh, uh, trustees for the uh, organization as of last year, uh, as of the uh, earlier part of this year, and, uh, and bringing in uh, uh, scholars uh, who can speak to the breadth and depth that is Maryland history. Uh, you know, this, this passion and purpose is about Maryland history. It's not black folk history. And it's not the history of uh, uh, what white people did to, uh, to black people per se. Uh, although that is, you, you cannot tell this story without confronting in some very real ways. And I'm proud to say this exhibition does that. The history, the legacy of white supremacy and its destructive sort of impact on our society. Uh, but if the Maryland Center for History and Culture is to be uh, what it wants to be and what it's striving to be, uh, then uh, why should this institution not take up uh, these projects? And I hope this project is but uh, the first of many other projects that explores, the again, the breadth and depth of Maryland. Uh, I love my old men on uh, horseback stories as much as the next historian, but that is not uh, the sum total of history. And the, you know, I tell my students at Morgan uh, all the time as, uh, as I'm pushing them to use collections like you have there at the Maryland Center uh, that, you know, graduate programs and who becomes a uh, elementary and high school school teacher uh, with every generation, the profile of who does that looks different and, and, and different people from different walks of life uh, come into these moments. And it's the responsibility of us all to not simply look forward, but to look back and pull, you know, uh, pull the stories and lessons of the different types of people who have made up our society, our world into the historical discussion so that they have meaning and relevance and use to us. I mean, that's the point of history. That's the point of a good story to help us see ourselves and our times uh, in the best and most productive ways. Well, for me, it's, it's a point that is actually crystal clear that as you say, uh, the Maryland Center for History and Culture is a predominantly white institution, and they're doing a show that talks about the civil rights movement. Uh, I, I see no problem in that. I like the that you are an institution that is at least recognizing that, you know, that situation. Uh, I think we have people still with blinders on who are ignoring their part in our American legacy. And so to know, to be able to recognize and do some self-reflection as I think your institution has uh, is fantastic that you say, well, we're a predominantly white institution. Uh, to do this exhibition, maybe we need to reach out to broaden. And I, I don't think it was just that step. I think your name change talked about how your institution wants to be something bigger. Uh, so, uh, historical societies around the U.S. have a particular kind of reputation. And we know that is not being inclusive in, in many ways. And so I think that name change is a step in the right direction to be broader, to, to recognize the community uh, that you serve. And uh, I think forming committees like this is wonderful. Uh, I think a white institution can do a, uh, a black subject if there is one. Uh, well, you know, I think that is true, but it doesn't, for me, deny that uh, the institution still has more work to do. And uh, hopefully this is not an end, but a beginning to something. And, um, you know, I, I love the historical society and I've done projects with you guys before. Uh, but of course, I would like to see a broader, more diverse uh, population in the staff at uh, the Historical Society or the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. And I, I should say um, that there is still a lot of work that we have to do, and and we are we are trying to do this work. So um, it wasn't just this exhibition, and then we consider it done. Um, we're we're still we're still trying. Of course, yeah. Um, 
It, Josh, if you have anything to add, or if not, I'll move on to a somewhat related question that I'll bet you do have some thoughts on. I'll, I'll combine my answers for okay. the two questions. So, so uh, kind of going along uh, what we were just talking about, um, I'm wondering if we can talk about the importance of language uh, and how it evolved in uh, how it's evolved in historical research interpretation. Uh, we had conversations about words like riot and unrest. Uh, we had conversations: should we should we use black? Should we use African American? Do, would you would you capitalize the B? Would you capitalize the W in white? Could could um could you talk a little bit about um. Uh, the educated language choices that we kind of made together. And that's for all of you, not not just you, Josh. So. I might just combine the answer to these two questions. I mean, I think one thing that if you see the name of this event tonight, it's Black Activism in Maryland. And that, that may seem like a small choice to some people, but I think there that that is a wise choice. And I think... Um, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even today, there are museums, um, not surprisingly, who don't want to do events with a title like that. The title isn't saying this exhibit is 100% about Black activists. I think what it's saying is this was a Black-led movement that was focused on power, equality, and freedom for Black people. Um, I think the exhibit, in a few instances, you know, references the fact that there were small numbers of white allies. And, um, but again, the focus of a discussion like this is on black activism in Maryland. I think connected to that, you know, a big debate among historians and organizers would be, well, does it make sense to include a group like the Black Panthers and an exhibit like this. And I think even among a lot of people who are involved in the Panthers, some of them would say, Paul Coates would say, we weren't a part of the civil rights movement. I think one thing the exhibit did that was really smart is that it showed the Panthers, it explicitly says this was really part of a black power movement but it also includes them in this larger exhibit. You know, for many years, the conventional wisdom was, hey, the Panthers were outcasts, they were renegades, they were troublemakers, don't include them in the story of uh, the benevolent civil rights movement. And I think this exhibit wisely does not make that mistake, which is becoming less common, but still there's a lot of people who would say, oh no, don't include them. They, they, they weren't making positive change. And I think that's that's important connecting both to the lens of this being a PWI and, and the lens of language and the question of who was and was not part of the quote unquote movement. Yeah, I would just offer that um, I think the, uh, the dialogue around terms and usage um, is important and it comes out in the uh, text and uh, some of the selections of audio clips, because that's always been a part uh, of not simply the civil rights movement, but the broader uh, sort of long-term struggle uh, from which the civil rights movement emerged. You know, I mean, we have to remember what we refer to as the civil rights movement largely acknowledges that at no point in time in the history of, uh, of oppression, particularly after emancipation, after the destruction of slavery, at no point in that time, uh, did African Americans ever concede or sheepishly go along uh, with uh, uh, being oppressed mm -hmm. and struggled mightily and consistently throughout the first several decades of the 20th century? And for reasons we can get into uh, in this form or perhaps another form, at some point in time, after particularly after World War II, uh, the politics and other forces in the nation caught up to the fact that, hey, you know, we, maybe they, there's something we do need to do collectively. You know, at, at some point, the white powers that be thought black civil rights was at least something worth talking about. And at some point, uh, legislating toward. Uh, but uh, all along this sort of long decades of struggle, even within the black community, there are discussions about terms, there are discussions about goals and methods and tactics. 
and uh, far too often because black history, relatively speaking, is only about two or three generations old in terms of public awareness and its presence, uh, even uh, inadequately, as some might argue, in the school systems and education processes. Uh, we, we all still suffer from a bit of presentism. We, we tend to think that as things are now, or as we are understanding them, for example, in the 60s, that they were somehow novel and new and unprecedented. You know, we live in, uh, we, we, I work, I live in Prince George's County, but in Baltimore City, there's a newspaper that's more than 125 years old that has always called itself, or at least from almost the very beginning, the Afro-American, you know, at, at a time when uh, colored was still in vogue at a time when Negro was still uh, not even uh, capitalized in, in most publications. And that the fact that the Afro had its name at that point in time gives us a clue about this dynamic conversation that may seem to be about words, but is really about the nature of the struggle and the goals that we are striving for, and the allies that we need to pull and the enemies that we need to identify. There's this dynamic process that is ongoing. And I think uh, that aspect of our process comes through in the final product uh, and just the breadth and depth of, of perspective that you have in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. The uh, exhibition is fascinating to me because uh, you have people telling their own stories, right? So they're, they're using the language of their moment and the way that they would talk. And then you can juxtapose that with the clips from the Afro or the News American or whatever it is and see what uh, a mainstream paper like the News American might say against the Afro or, or with the Afro and what an individual would say, you know? And it just allows you to see that language is fluid and it gave you different perspectives. Uh, and I think that was a big part of our conversation that this word or that word is appropriate for the time. This is the word that, you know, would have been conventional, you know, that sort of thing. So I think we did have some energetic conversations about language and it's important. And I think the show responded by giving a, a great range for you to see and think for yourself, make those, you know, critical thinking leaps about, well, why is it phrased one way here and why they say it this way there, you know, and it allowed, it's another thing for me about the show not really doing a whole lot of interpreting and telling its audience what to think, but giving a broad perspective of information and allowing people to see for themselves, you know. Yeah, I would be remiss if I did not. Um, we've talked about oral history and photographs, but the Afro-American newspaper is a is a tremendous resource. Mm -hmm. And uh, the folks in their archives, Savannah, Dion, were just tremendously helpful in helping us put this together. And, um, you know, we did, I think we used some Baltimore Sun images possibly. Uh, but, you know, Luckily, in our area, um, both of those newspapers are very well archived, mm -hmm. and they're just a tremendous resource. I always tell people, um, you know, if you're not a student, get yourself a Pratt Library card, <laughs> have access to ProQuest. It's all there for you. Um, it, you could get lost in it for days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give a nod to the Afro-American newspaper for being such a great um, resource. We... Uh, we have a great debate going on in the chat in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, we're at about 10 of. I want to leave some time for, um, for, for questions from our viewers. Uh, maybe just one more brief one. Um, I, I think we were all at the opening uh, for this show. Um, we were all masked up and freaked out mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID. Um, but it was, it was a really special night. And um, I'm wondering if briefly you could talk about the role of the descendants in deciding how their family members' stories are told um, and, and how we achieve that. Um, I, I, okay, I won't um, answer my own questions. So. <laughs> I'll just generally say I thought it was beautiful. Uh, the, for the voices that had passed on, 
for their proud descendants to be there and, and, and understand the significance of what mom or dad or granddad did, that is amazing inspiration. Uh, so I loved that. And I think you guys organized the whole reception beautifully with the speakers uh, and the uh, just flowing through the exhibition on your own. I thought it was a, a beautiful thing to have so many generations coming together on the same subject. And uh, I, I thought it was really wonderful. Because um, uh, so much of uh, particularly the visual uh, aspect of the uh, the exhibition, you know, if, if it doesn't capture uh, purposely, for example, everyday life, everyday life is, is the obvious context, everyday people in crowds or uh, mm -hmm. scenes from churches or scenes from rallies. And, uh, you know, having worked in and around museums and being connected to uh, exhibitions and, and, and uh, similar sort of his historical investigations, you know, um, but I, I, I didn't tire that night of congratulating the staff and, and hoping that they were mm -hmm. taking in what for them had to be, it had to be a proud moment. When you see, you know, everyday folk, you can't hear their conversations, but you see them pointing at the picture and then pointing at themselves or, or talking about, you know, you'll hear bits and pieces of, you know, there's a high school yearbook, for example, that's in the exhibition. And, uh, the, the way in which our grasp of history is evolving as a society. Uh, it, on one hand, it's sort of accessible and perhaps it's perhaps open to be abused by those who uh, may uh, twist it and try to use it uh, for what um, it, it actually does not tell us that the facts don't support. But for those who are involved in you know, genealogical research, and, uh, you know, the, the, history, uh, the Maryland Center for History and Culture uh, has wonderful genealogical resources, uh, by the way, uh, it's part of a growing community of institutions in and around the state that can help Maryland to sort of establish their roots uh, here in the state. But suffice it to say, uh, in putting together family histories, these broader social histories and political histories and understandings of economic uh, context, all of these things are necessary. And you see a much more educated, not degree, not necessarily, you don't have to have a college degree to understand these things, but uh, you know, to put it frankly, for looking for mom and them, you come to understand the world in which they lived. And if you're fortunate enough to walk around an exhibition like this with someone, say, who was alive and conscious and participating or at least witnessing in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, it's a rich and wonderful uh, op uh, opportunity to take advantage of. But if you know, that person is no longer there, it's a wonderful way to get a sense, uh, you know, for uh, your family's sort of uh, path and, and, and sort of uh, the context in which they lived, because again, it is so focused on helping people see everyday lives and, and hear everyday voices about things that we normally normally uh, uh, associate uh, as unique or, or only happening to or involving a select few of people. You know, social movements involve us all and touch us all, certainly, whether we, we understand that or not. Mm -hmm. I'll just add quickly, uh, I really wanted to commend uh, the MCHC staff who worked on this because one of the things they really did was they really tried to research all the people whose names and pictures and voices re uh, appeared in this exhibit. Mm -hmm. If they're alive, they tried to find them. In many cases, they weren't alive. And so mm -hmm. then they were researching how to contact family members, some of them easy to find, many of them not. And I'm not going to say that this is unique, but I, I don't think this is the norm for museum exhibits where um, staff are spending time trying to find dozens and dozens and dozens of family members to just say, hey, your father, your uncle, your mother, your grandmother, they're in this exhibit and we're having this opening and we'd love it if you come. Not just we have this exhibit, but hey, we're kind of having this, you know, we're, have, we're going to throw a party to open this thing and we would be honored if you come. And I think that um, the staff on this exhibit really took that responsibility importantly. And uh, that, that was great to see.
Thank you for uh, calling attention to that. Uh, my colleagues really did outdo themselves. And um, I was thinking about, you know, the Mitchell family was there um, with uh, plenty of relatives represented in the show. Senator Braley's family was there. I, I know I'm going to leave people out and I feel terrible, but it was um, it was really heartening to see uh, um, descendants like interacting with with the exhibition and and their um, and their family. It was it was amazing. Um, and and Josh, you helped uh, again back to Walter Carter, but you know you put us in touch with with Senator Carter um, to to make sure he was included. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad we had a chance to do that. We are fastly approaching um, seven o'clock and I wanna get to a couple uh, questions if it's possible um, before we all turn into pumpkins because it's October. Um, there's a raging debate in the chat about when uh, we should say that the civil rights movement began, I think. That's like a book length answer question. So perhaps we'll let people. I think David's already answered it. I think yes. that as long as there are people who were oppressed, there was always a civil rights movement, civil rights activist. We might talk about, you know, like the Harlem Renaissance when there was this bigger explosion where it seemed like more things were coalescing, but it continues today. It hasn't ended. and. It's always been there. Yeah. For me, it's always been a question to allies. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, have a piece in Maryland Historical Magazine recently uh, where I try to uh, distinguish between the idea of uh, the Black struggle as a social struggle and this notion of a movement, a collective sort of mm. uh, political and economic and social agenda when other people who are otherwise don't feel impacted uh, sort of lend whatever they have to lend. And for me, that's right after World War II. There are domestic reasons for that, but there are also international reasons. Yeah. The Cold War, you know, it's uh, you know, locally, we can see it in our gubernatorial politics at that time. We can see it in our mayoral politics. Hell, even uh, President Harry Truman, a man from rural Missouri, said with a straight face he had no idea that lynchings were so bad in 1946 when he realized that Black people in big cities like Baltimore and Chicago and Detroit might actually vote for his opponent. Suddenly he cared. Uh, no shot at the president, but suffice it to say, 10 years earlier, that was not the case. So. We have a question from Bradley Alston. Uh, Professor Terry shares in his book about the contribution of the Communist Party in helping to jumpstart the civil rights movement in the 1930s in Baltimore. Uh, through the anti-lynching campaign and worker organizing. Uh, would David, would you share a little bit about that interesting development? Yeah, and, and, and uh, hello to uh, Mr. Austin, folks over at the Baltimore City Historical Society do wonderful work in their own right. Um, and I actually, uh, if you uh, read the passages in my book, I, I give all credit to uh, other scholars who look more closely at labor and uh, sort of uh, left activism at that time period. Uh, Ando Scottnez's his book on the New Deal in Baltimore in the 30s, I think, is the gold standard uh, in that way. But there have been other books that have written about it. But suffice it to say uh, that uh, there have always been allies and they've come in different uh, political uh, outfits and for a very long time, beginning uh, really in the 1920s, uh, uh, but certainly ramping up at about the time that labor organizing was becoming legitimized during the New Deal. It were it was uh, leftists, particularly communists, uh, uh, even on the ground uh, in formerly Jim Crow states like Maryland, but even as far south as Alabama, who were sort of stepping forward to try to present themselves in their ways and uh, to some degree their doctrine uh, as an alternative to those who were claiming to be for freedom and equality, but were acting and reserving uh, that privilege uh, for people who did not uh, uh, have uh, uh, black blood in their veins. So uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Austin, for bringing it up. We have a question from Alex Smith Burden. Uh, being a city that led the nation in, and I'm going to say this is probably, there's probably a book answer to this question. <laughs> being a city that led the nation in discriminatory housing practices like redlining and various other uh, segregatory housing policies, 
the city engineered? How did Black activism and discriminatory urban planning clash in Baltimore? Uh, that is a, it's a big question, you know, uh, this idea of the redlining and the discriminate, discrimination in housing, major uh, issue in civil rights and social understanding of how you build wealth, how you build legacy. Uh, I think... I'm not sure of the nuance in the question. There's, it's so broad, but I think that people have always been trying to legislate against, uh, but there's, you know, we're still doing it today. We. If I could, I would simply uh, say that uh, if following the theme of the exhibition, mm -hmm. and Joe, you mentioned uh, the, the, the cache of uh, oral histories that I had conducted for another purpose many, many years ago, but contributed not only to the project, but to the institution. Uh, I had the chance to talk to a lot of people who were coming up in Baltimore, uh, either as the parents of young families, you know, World War II vets, or who were themselves school children at about the time desegregation uh, was beginning to be implemented in the mid fifties. And a lot of them uh, talked about, and these are you know, black and white individuals, talked about the beginnings of what we might call the segregation in Baltimore neighborhoods. And it's funny how we, we read about them sort of in their formal executions, their constructions, as well as uh, uh, deconstructions. Uh, you know, Antero, uh, uh, Antero's book, uh, Not in My Backyard, or Not in My Neighborhood, pardon me, uh, gives us a really good structural overview. But it was funny how many folks you talk to who talk about being the first black in a neighborhood or the last white person in the neighborhood, you get a, a wholly different sense, uh, really sort of came down to one's idea of one's needs and or preservation. Um, you know, uh, as soon as an opportunity opened up, you know, black folk would move into a neighborhood because they needed housing. And the, the larger sort of theoretical questions that we have about rights, this, that, and the other, uh, I'll never forget, um, a woman named Thelma Parker told me about her family moving uh, into a neighborhood near, uh, I think it, uh, it used to be called Easterwood Park. I think it's called uh, Braley Park now, over on Pressman and Ventilou. But suffice it to say, her dad had been a war vet, World War II. She said he pulled up with his uh, moving van. He got out of his moving van, held his World War II rifle over his head so all of his neighbors could see that there was going to be no monkey business today. And he moved his family in his house and they had a wonderful time living there for a generation. So. Uh, there are all sorts of ways in which we can pull, I think, these everyday stories into the larger structural stories of how Jim Crow was ultimately broken down. Uh, does that mean that uh, the Parker's role and their approach to moving into this new neighborhood was any more important than, say, Shelley v. Kramer, the Supreme Court case in 1948 that broke down restrictive covenants and actually allowed the Parkers to take that? I don't think we have to make that decision. I think we can take them both as contributing factors uh, to how history ultimately unfolds. Yeah, to add something just really brief, I mean, um, David mentioned uh, Antero Patilla's book. Um, Ed Orser wrote a book some years ago, Lawrence Brown's more recent work. Um, and a lot of that focuses on housing segregation. I think something that's exciting that historians have been doing work on very recently is looking at things like the, the the road to nowhere, right? The highway to nowhere, not just um, the construction of segregated housing and racial exclusion, but also uh, displacement and destruction and how that um, has affected black and white people very differently and affected black residents in the United States very differently. There's a historian in Seattle named Emily Lieb, L-I-E-B, and she has been writing a book about movements to try to stop the highway to nowhere back in, in the 60s and, and 70s. And um, I believe her book is coming out next year. But uh, that's going to be, I think, a good book for our city to kind of find a lot of this history that is often buried in places like the sun, the Afro, a lot of these places, but hasn't really been written about at length. Um, and that displacement, of course, continues, right? Any people who've been following 
I mean, it's in front of our eyes in many ways, but, you know, a lot of people probably noticed the campaign ongoing this year to save the Poppleton community and how um, displacement is is continuing apace and um, is very has very racially disparate impacts in our city. Thank you for mentioning that, Josh. Um, we attended the uh, Baltimore Heritage Unconference recently, and there was um, there was some really great talk about what's happening over in Poppleton. Uh, um, well, it is uh, seven oh five, and as a uh, there are still some questions, but as a great showman, and I believe Linda said earlier, uh, leave them wanting more. Um, Passion and Purpose, Voices of Maryland's Civil Rights Activists is a long-term show at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. We have a community gallery built into the exhibition. We will be having in-person events there um, probably next year. Um, there'll, there'll be some program, but we certainly will keep this discussion going um, as we move forward. And I just want to thank uh, the three of you for for doing this with us tonight and for your work and uh, in, in your fields and for helping us uh, the work you did on creating this exhibition. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. Thank you. Go get some dinner, everyone. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.